my first question is about uh, global finance. So from the perspective of global finance, what are the issues that are not being addressed or discussed at all? The problem that we have in terms of regulating global finance is first one of cooperation and coordination. Most countries have introduced new regulations after the financial crisis, but all of those new regulations are primarily directed towards national markets and the development or the improvement in the stability of those national markets. Now since most of these markets are different and since the cause of the spread of the crisis was different, for example, between the US and Europe and then subsequently the way it hit emerging market economies, all of these measures tend to be different. Now because they're different, they create additional possibilities for what we call regulatory arbitrage. That is, as long as international banks are still able to operate across markets, they will be able to take advantage of differences in these uh, specific national regulations in order to carry out activities that would probably be either controlled or limited in their home countries uh, without any sort of regulation in other markets. So this leads to the question of what kind of international cooperation or what kind of general set of regulatory controls we're going to have. And Within the national, or the, sorry, the global context, there are sort of two main areas in which this occurs. One is in terms of setting minimum standards. So if you look at the Basel Committee, for example, the Basel Committee basically sets out minimum core principles that all financial systems should be willing to follow. The Financial Stability Board more or less does the same thing, that is they're trying to find minimum standards that all countries have to accept. Now, in principle, if everybody accepts the same minimum standards, then you get, by definition, a minimum degree of cooperation across countries. So that this is the first step in trying to resolve this problem of differences in, uh, in global regulation. The real difficulties come in terms of the specifics of the particular programs. So if you take, for example, the United States introduces Dodd-Frank, the uh, Vickers report in the United Kingdom deals with a similar set of, similar set of issues. The Lacanon report for Europe also deals with a similar set of issues, but they all deal with those issues in a slightly different way. And this is where the difficulties occur. So even if you accept that all of, the, all of the financial institutions will be using this basic set of core principles or minimum standards, there are always going to be sufficient differences in order to create problems. So if you take the best example of this was during the regulation in the United States under Glass-Steagall, which said that U.S. banks could not undertake uh, operations in securities. All they had to do was to open a uh, branch in London and they could do any kind of operation that they wanted to because London had what already in the 1970s was called light touch regulation. Basically the British regulation said that we regulate British banks because they are our home banks but any foreign bank that operates in the United Kingdom we will not regulate at all. So basically it created one of these regulatory gaps or the possibility for this uh, regulatory arbitrage. Now, this is minimized, we said, by these minimum standards, but it hasn't gone away. And this means that there will be substantial parts of the financial system that will not be regulated in the same way in all countries. Now, one of the uh, proposals that we've seen in the United States uh, tries to deal with this, tries to deal with this difficulty by recommending that all foreign banks operating in the United States should be subsidiaries that are regulated, not only regulated by the Federal Reserve, but that also, that also should be independently capitalized. Okay? And in addition to that, there is an application of what is called in the Fed regulations, Regulation W, or under the statutes, it's uh, Section 23, which deals with the operations 
between a home country holding company and its subsidiaries. And basically it says that if you set up a U.S. subsidiary, not only does it have to be independently capitalized, but it cannot make transactions with the home country holding corporation so that it basically becomes an independent unit subject to U.S. regulations. Now, this solves the problem for the United States of the regulatory arbitrage across borders, but it creates the problem for everybody else. So this is an example of how, this, how these difficulties arise even when you have an attempt to try and eliminate those uh, arbitrage uh, possibilities. So, uh, you have emphasized that in this global crisis, you do need global reform. Uh, so my question is, what is the arena that is appropriate to come up with this global reform? Should this be done at the United Nations level or the G20 level? Uh, what would be your recommendation? Well, I've already mentioned that we have within the Financial Stability Board and the Basel Committee of uh, Banking Supervision an attempt to set these minimum standards. Now the difficulty, as I mentioned, with these minimum standards is that in general the crisis had a different aspect in different countries depending on the structure of the financial system. So that basically if you take a very good Brazilian example, application of Basel Committee uh, capital regulations or setting minimum capital ratios may make sense for Brazilian banks, but they're also set up to deal with countries that have a large and active investment banking operation within those bank holding companies. Now, Brazil has very little in terms of investment banking within the private banking sector. Most of this takes place within the National Development Bank and the Brazilian Central Bank has now decided that the capital regulations from Basel will be applied to this bank, to the Brazilian Development Bank. Now this makes absolutely no sense. No sense why? Because it is not a traditional investment bank. An investment bank does what? Well basically an investment bank under the uh, British or the US uh, approach would be dealing in wholesale money markets, borrowing monies which are then lent for business or investment purposes. Now, BNDES does not borrow in capital markets, basically because there is no Brazilian capital market to borrow in, and it does not borrow in foreign capital markets. So the basic idea of having capital controls in order to limit the balance sheet composition of an investment bank simply doesn't apply. So here is a case of trying to use a minimum standard in a case where it has absolutely no application whatsoever because the financial structure of the country is different from those countries which the regulations are designed to help. So that's one of the, the as I say, one of the big problems that you have in terms of looking at the way these are applied. Now if you follow out this, uh, this reasoning, it says that basically you might not want to have any more than a very, very low minimum standard applied across all countries. Why? Because most countries have financial systems which are different. The kinds of minimum standards, the core principles that the Basel Committee sets up were primarily designed on the basis of the U.S. financial system and also to a certain extent the U.K. financial system because the two of them are now more or less uh, fully integrated. So while these things are, you know, they're very nice for the U.S. financial system, they're probably not very good for emerging market financial systems basically because those emerging market financial systems are not yet fully developed and it's not really obvious that we want them to develop in the same way that the U.S. financial system has developed because if the U.S. system is any example, it's certainly not one that lends to uh, long-term stability in terms of financing. Now, developing countries have always had difficulties with their banking systems and financial systems, recurrent crises, and trying to impose on them a regulatory system that is primarily designed to create a financial system similar to that in the U.S. is probably not the best way to introduce stability in those systems. You have emphasized uh, in terms of the new proposals uh, the attention that has been paid to liquidity ratios and capital ratios and you have stressed the need to look at the asset side of banks since banks operate from assets to 
liabilities. So regulation should be looking at the asset side of the bank balance sheet. So in terms of the new proposals that are being made, to what extent they bring something new to the table in terms of trying to come up with effective ways to regulate banking activity and liquidity creation in particular? The kinds of regulations that have been introduced in developed countries, basically the previously mentioned Dodd-Frank and the, similar the Vickers Report and others, are primarily designed to prevent the public sector from having to intervene in order to resolve or to rescue failed banks. So that if we think of the financial system or the banking system as basically a public-private partnership, what these regulations do is to attempt to limit the degree to which the public will have to intervene uh, in order to rescue these institutions. What it doesn't do is to place very large limits on the activities of these banks. I mean, basically what it says is you can continue to operate as you've done before with some small uh, limitations on terms of some basic investment activities of these banks, but it primarily says what we want is a capital buffer which is sufficiently large to be able to cover any likely loss that you will incur by doing what you're doing. So in difference from previous regulations, Glass-Steagall and others, which attempted to not only create a particular financial structure, for example, Glass-Steagall created a structure in which you had separation between deposit-taking banking and investment banking. It doesn't attempt to place very large controls on the way banks operate. Now, if we take, again, the basic difference between Glass-Steagall and what came afterwards, the presumption of Glass-Steagall was that the banks were going to be taking short-term deposits and that they were going to be lending on a short-term basis to what were basically self-liquidating loans. That is, these were short-term loans, commercial loans against particular types of collateral that would produce, in the end, the income that would repay those loans. So basically the Glass-Steagall system was a system which required the banks to evaluate the ability of the borrowers to generate the income to pay back those loans. Now, when we went to the uh, reform of Glass-Steagall and finally the repeal of Glass-Steagall in the uh, graham leach Bliley Act, and then subsequently in Dodd-Frank, what we're now saying is that, well, we recognize that the business of banking okay, is now completely different. So that if you take the normal bank under securitization, the bank originates a loan, repackages the loan, sells the loan into the capital market, it doesn't hold it on its balance sheet any longer. So that there's really no incentive for the bank to do the kind of assessment of the income that is generated by the assets that it creates. Okay? So the first step, you would say, of going back to the kind of system, the stability we had under Glass-Steagall, would be to try and create incentives that, for banks to try and generate their profits by making sure that their borrowers generate a sufficient amount of income to pay back the loans. Now, if you're not doing that, if you're not holding the loans, how do you make your money? Well, on the one hand, you make it on loans and commissions that you get from arranging the loans, packaging the loans, selling them into the market, and you also make a substantial amount of money from your own investment portfolio. Now, this is what Glass-Steagall said that banks should not be doing, but this is what banks could do, and they did increasingly after Graham Leach Bliley, which meant that the bank's income is now generated, first of all, by the changes in the capital value of the assets that it's holding. So basically, they speculate in order to increase uh, their incomes. And secondly, by increasing leverage. Because if you're looking at the return on the equity of the bank, the return on the equity is basically determined by the income they make on their uh, assets and the leverage that they have. So that basically this sort of financial system generates income that is much more volatile than it would be and it takes away from the bankers the idea of assessing the profitability of the borrower uh, in terms of what it's actually using the money for and shifts that emphasis to trying to predict what happens to asset prices.
So that basically banks are now generating at something like 30 to 40 percent of their income simply by speculating in the markets on leverage. And this means that their incomes are going to be much more volatile. And this is why we've now moved towards increased capital buffers. Because the idea is if banks continue to do this, then eventually they are also going to make losses. That is, if the market is in fact rational and efficient, then prices go up and prices go down. And this is what we saw in the, in the real estate market. As long as banks were able to increase their profits as a result of the increase in in prices, everything was fine. But when the prices reversed, or if they made bad investment decisions, as they did when they held a lot of the AAA, AAA assets, then you're going to make losses. And the point is that the income is no longer sufficient to balance those losses. So this is why you've moved basically towards the, uh, the capital movements. So basically, like I said, if, if you want to bring back stability in terms of earnings, if you want to reduce the reliance on capital buffers and return to a system in which basically banks' incomes were sufficiently high to cover any probable losses, you have to place restrictions on the kinds of investments that they hold, on the kinds of assets that they're doing. And this is one of the uh, objectives of the so-called Volcker Rule, the Volcker Proposal, which says that banks should not be using their own funds for proprietary trading. Now, the difficulty here is that this applies only to the banks. It doesn't necessarily apply to the bank holding companies that the banks are part of. So we're now back to this difficulty of how you regulate the relationship between the, uh, the banking or the deposit-taking subsidiary and the overall holding company. And this is back to this, what we mentioned before, this question of uh, Section 23, which attempts to limit the movement between the banking subsidiary and the holding company. Now, a very good example of why this is important, recently Morgan Stanley, which held most of its derivatives transactions in the bank holding company, has recently moved all of those derivatives transactions to the deposit-taking subsidiary, that is, to the banking subsidiary. Now, why is this important? Well, it's basically it's important because of a very strange rule that was set up during the uh, deregulation under the Clinton, uh, the Clinton administration, which says that if you have a bank failure and the FDIC comes in to resolve the bank, those derivative exposures are in more or less exempted from the bankruptcy process. That is, they get paid off before anybody else gets paid off. So basically what this has done is to create an additional difficulty or an additional charge on the FDIC, the insurance corporation, which is normally in charge of resolving, uh, resolving banks. So this becomes, you know, this becomes a very difficult, uh, a difficult problem to resolve because basically it says if you have a very large derivatives book, that derivatives book gets paid off before you take the money away from the bondholders, from the shareholders and the other uh, the other supposedly people who are bearing the risk of those uh, those transactions. Let's let's change the subject and briefly talk about Brazil. No, briefly, uh, five years ago, four years ago, you mentioned that Brazil experienced uh, really good conditions that no longer will be in place. Uh, and since then, Brazil has been struggling to bring about economic growth. Uh, in terms of development strategies, uh, what would be your recommendations in terms of shifting or changing development strategies in this new global structure that we have post-financial uh, crisis? Well, the implication of the financial crisis pretty clearly led to the very large change in the role of financial institutions in the influence on commodity prices. Everybody always believes that China is the basic driver of commodity prices. It's, uh, it's in some cases, verifiable. Yes, China does build up large amounts of copper reserves, for example, in warehouses. But it's not clear that this is the case in terms of what we call soft commodities, basically the kinds of commodities for which Brazil is a major, uh, a major exporter. It's more reasonable to believe that the creation of what we call commodity index funds were a big driver of the change in commodity prices. Uh, 
Now, the financial crisis meant that, number one, it was more difficult for banks to engage in the kinds of speculation in commodity prices that they did before. And secondly, the new regulatory environment is going to make it more difficult. So, for example, if you take Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs, up until about six months ago, was the largest operator of warehouse facilities in the United States. Now, why would an investment bank want warehouses? They wanted warehouses because they had shifted their speculation in commodity prices from futures com markets to the actual physical purchase of commodities. They have recently sold most of those warehouses, which means that they're no longer in this business. So whatever happens with global conditions, it means that the increase in commodity prices or what generated the increasing terms of trade for Brazil will be dampened, if not reversed. So that on the first hand, the factors which eliminated the external, so-called external constraint for Brazil will be attenuated or will probably disappear. So Brazil is again going to be facing an external constraint. So the question is how you deal with that particular problem. Now, if you're running most of your domestic fiscal policy and your expenditure policy on the inside on the basis of an improvement in the terms of trade and those terms of trade disappear, it means that either you have to cut back on your fiscal balance and to create a, uh, a smaller deficit or a preferably a surplus, or the alternative is that you have to shift the sources of revenue and the sources of demand. But this would take a decision on the part of the government, number one, to reduce the dependence on the external factors, to reduce the exports by means of, for example, putting a tax on exports or trying to eliminate the transfer of uh, agricultural production towards those areas that were expanding most rapidly in terms of domestic demand. Secondly, the idea that you can use the increase in the terms of trade in order to finance your social policies through uh, plans such as Fome Zero and others as a simple transfer program is no longer viable. So that an alternative type of program, such, an employee, such as an employer of last resort program, provides the alternative that it gives you the same impact on incomes, but it also gives you an impact in terms of outputs, so that you're no longer reliant on selling abroad in order to finance your domestic social policies. Your domestic social policies then also become domestically driven or domestically determined. So this is the basic problem that's facing Brazil in terms of the new global environment that it has to recognize that it does have the ability to do this, but it doesn't happen automatically. That is, the government has to take active decisions in order to engineer those sorts of policies by building up domestic manufacturing capacity, in particular in the uh, light manufactured goods areas, which are the primary areas that do respond to improvements in income distribution. That is, lower income families are buying these sorts of products. There's no reason to be buying them from China if Brazil can produce them domestically. But you have to create a market in which that happens.